First up, uh, let's talk to Work and Pensions Secretary, uh, Theresa Coffey, who joins us on the line. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Julia. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, you're announcing a new national strategy uh, for disability, um, particularly related to travel, aren't you? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, sure. We've been listening to people uh, with disability uh, to understand how we can make, make their lives better on a daily basis. So it's a really wide ranging strategy with over 100 commitments. One of the best ways is about how we can make it easier for people to travel. So we've got the uh, announcements that will be happening on buses, but also we're looking into how we can make it easier for people to feel safer on the trains and be able to contact the guard much more easily, as well as access to stations and trains as well. Yeah. So a variety of ways and uh, indeed even sport. And while we're celebrating Team G. B, of course, next month we'll be hopefully celebrating the Paralympics as well. So there's a number of activities where right across government uh, we'll be trying to help just that bit of life be that bit easier every day. Yeah. I mean, I know there's issues, obviously, with accessible housing, and that's going to be an issue, I think, just even just with an older population as things go. So we need to be moving to that. But on the travel issue, I know covering the st stories on the show in previous uh, months about you know, disabled people not being able to get on in their wheelchairs onto buses that have an area designed for them in the middle of the bus for them to use because people, you know, mums and dads have got their, their buggies for their kids there. Now, obviously, when I was a, a mum of a young child, I used to put my buggy on the bus there. But those faces are actually campaigned for and are therefore disabled uh, passengers. And we really need to make sure that the people who need these spaces get to use them and that there shouldn't have to be a scene. And, and certainly we shouldn't have a scene where people who are in wheelchairs are left you know, in the pouring rain at a bus stop, unable to get on a bus. Well, I think that's right. Uh, and uh, we am conscious that this strategy is not only uh, setting out what government is going to do, but it's actually a call to action right across society. Um, in order, to, whether it's employers, about how we can make them more confident about taking people on with disabilities, with the amount of talent that's available, uh, but also um, just society more generally, about how we can think of, on a daily basis, how we can be more inclusive. Because one of the things, themes that came strongly from our survey and our interactions with people with disability was about aspects of feeling isolated, excluded rather than included. And that's why things like accessing the countryside and culture is another feature of what we are doing in this strategy. OK, well, talking of people not being excluded, I wonder if you agree with your colleague, Michael Gove, who has said that uh, people who don't have the COVID vaccine are selfish. And, and frankly, um, if they don't have the, the, the vaccine and they're not able to get hold of a vaccine passport, when, if and when they are brought in, uh, then it will be their own fault. Is he right? Well, Julia, I, I understand Michael has said that, and I think he is trying to make people realise that by not having the vaccine when it's perfectly safe to do so, although I'm conscious that there are people who clinically have been advised not to take it, is that we really do want to properly open up society and not only to protect ourselves, but also to protect each other. And so in a way, what, what is the problem with having a vaccine? Undoubtedly, some people are scared. We need to help them to recognise this is a very safe, but really important for making sure that society is inclusive. Um, look, you and I have both double jabbed. Um, at our age, it is wise to be double jabbed. The odds are, are, are in favour in terms of the trade off of the risks of the vaccine and the risks of COVID. It makes sense to be double jabbed. For younger people, for an 18 year old, actually, the risks of COVID are so infinitesimally small. Uh, and there are risks of this vaccine. It's not 100 percent safe. No vaccine is. No medical treatment is. And we know uh, in terms of the trade off that actually if someone certainly believes they've already had COVID themselves, maybe tested positive, that actually that would be a risk it'd be unnecessary for them to take that's just them making a decision about their own body it doesn't make them selfish does it well young people are used to having vaccines regardless i can imagine uh most children will have had mmr uh they'll be having the hpv they'll be having uh if they're traveling uh probably hepatitis mm. a b uh rabies you know vaccines are a daily part a regular part of life i think in particular on this one i hear what you say julia but undoubtedly the vaccine, having the vaccine definitely reduces the risk of transmission if you are carrying the virus and you're not aware. And that's why we'd still want to encourage as many people as possible. Encouraging to do people that. all in favour of. Wagging fingers, accusing people of being selfish, threatening to not allow students uh, to go to halls of residence, to go to lectures, not being able to go to a nightclub, not being able to do, live your normal life, go to a football match. That's a very different thing, isn't it? All in favour of more education, more encouragement, campaigns to encourage people to do this. But that's a very different thing from accusing young people who have lost out far more than you or I or any one of our age group has lost out in the last year uh, and telling them off. Well, I would say a lot of young people have taken advantage of having the vaccine. We just want to encourage more to do so. 
you know, I, I recognise what you say. Um, I can understand why people do feel that their lives have, in effect, have been put on hold due to this awful um, uh, virus. But we also know that the vaccines are the best way to tackle the impact okay. of the virus for ourselves and for others. Why do we trust the vaccine for a vaccine passport to go to university, to go to um, uh, a nightclub? Apparently, that's what the requirement will be by the autumn. I mean, over my dead body, frankly, I will be campaigning uh, uh, against that. And I would hope you, as someone who's been campaigning for freedom over many years, that would, would also be speaking out about that in, in Cabinet. But but um, why do we recognise the, the power of the vaccine and the, and the vaccine passport in those scenarios but we don't recognize it when people are traveling uh, abroad why do people still have to take a huge number of tests why do people have to self-isolate if they've got double jab proof when they're coming into the country well we are taking steps as you know gradual steps as we still understand aspects of the impact of uh, the coronavirus and understandably uh, new variants have emerged uh, may, m m more may come so i think it's about having a cautious approach the primary objective is to protect the public in the in this country and that's why we need to be very careful at the borders and where people have been abroad uh, where the new variants may have happened but as you know we've opened up uh, the process so its uh, requirements are a lot less stringent um, for those people who've had both um, doses and have uh, and after 14 days and we'll be taking that careful step uh, on the 16th of August as well um, four weeks after we've opened up uh, a step four, which is only last week, uh, Julia, uh, four weeks on, we'll be in the situation where people who've been double vaccinated with that 14 day gap uh, are able to um, not uh, not isolate uh, if they've been notified or tested um, or been pinged, I should say. Just so uh, it's important that we take this carefully because we still have a huge number of infections in this country even though it's great to see the daily rates coming down. Well, I mean, it's, it's not a huge number. It, it's plummeting. It's halved in the last week. Look, how is it, how is it protecting people, for instance, for someone like me? Uh, I've been double jabbed. I've had COVID. I've had two negative COVID tests. And yet I am forced by law, uh, according to uh, under the NHS test and trace rules, to be self-isolating until midnight tonight, party time at one minute past midnight. Um, I'm actually forced to stay in my home since last Friday because someone on my flight tested positive uh, over you know, a week and a half ago. Um, I've tested negative twice since but but I'm still not allowed out of my home who whose lives am I protecting well it may be other people you would come into contact with but I but I haven't got COVID but the strong medical advice is that of course symptoms can develop at any point uh, over up to a 10-day period that's why the self-isolation period but I've not been required days. to take another test since the test I took last Saturday so I understand that, um, Julia, but as I say, we're just taking these cautious steps. We've got very strong medical and scientific advice that by leaving that four week gap after the 19th of July gives us the best chance to, again, make sure that we keep uh, on this p path of freedom. Uh, and uh, it's not that long to wait. Uh, but as ever, you know, the data is looking encouraging and it's showing the power of the vaccines, as you have demonstrated yourself. Uh, yeah. But there's still a risk, as you are aware. It doesn't necessarily have 100% effectiveness well, for everybody, um, but that's why we still want to be careful. Why, why then just wait, why, why will the House of Parliament not require a vaccine passport, but say, um, you know, a nightclub or a football match would? Why, why is that? Well, I think the policy is in consideration about high risk transmission environment. Um, I, well, is, I mean, uh, Westminster has been a COVID a petri dish, for goodness sake. Well, um, I, 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 I do hear what you say. I mean, all these things, again, as the Prime Minister indicated, uh, we're looking in, at the interests of trying to weather a high risk uh, transmission areas. And uh, I know that there was some concern when nightclubs opened up and a lot of young people were in there. Of course, yeah, it was I, brilliant, you know, wasn't it? it was if brilliant. I was that age, I'd probably be enjoying myself, too. Um, I mean, that's 30 years ago, really. But uh, it's uh, a case of um, I, I, I know it's been difficult, but it's important that we get through this. Uh, it's not long to wait. And uh, I'm really keen to see more people get the benefits of the double jab. Okay. And it be then we'll be rocking and rolling come the autumn, I'm sure. All right. Therese Coffey, uh, welcome, Pedersecretary. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Uh,